How's everyone doing? So, Strength Chat episode 65, and today I have got a very special guest for you. Today I am joined by the co-owner of Movement as, Movement as Medicine. He's also spoken around the world uh, and educating and certifying the certified functional strength coaches and perform better coaches. He's also a coach at Mike Boyle Strength and Conditioning. Today I am joined by Kevin Carr. How are you doing? I'm well, thank you, Stephen. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. No worries at all. Um, what have you been up to? What have you been doing recently? Just uh, working away at uh, Mike Boyle Strength and Conditioning. We're kind of in the spring session now, and uh, we're starting to kind of game plan for our summer uh, program as well. So, you know, just, just hitting it hard in the gym this whole month, and, and same as in the clinic. Nice. Um, how about, uh, have you been doing much traveling and doing many courses recently, or is it, have you been mainly based, uh, based in one place at the minute? Uh, March was a busy month of travel, uh, lots of European, uh, dates. So I was in, um, Budapest and I was in split Korea, and, uh, now I'm, I'm back for the next like six weeks, but then we'll pick back up in May to Dubai and Shanghai and Sao Paulo. So you know, kind of month type of schedule here right now. Yeah. Ah, some nice, uh, some nice places that you're going to then. Do you get to, do you get time to enjoy the places that you go to or is it in there? Yeah, I try to. I mean, but I'm going a long way. Uh, I try to do two in one trip, you know, it just limits the amount of flights I have to get on. Yeah. So then I can get a little bit of work time and relax time in between. Okay. Uh, um, but you lost, sometimes it's in and out, you know, so the best of the travel. Yeah. Oh, nice. Um, so for everyone listening who might not know your background and how you got to be the position that you're in now, uh, just want to give a little bit of a background to yourself. Uh, um, I'm a strength and conditioning coach at Mike Boyle Strength and Conditioning. I've been working in that capacity some sort uh, since about 2008 working with you know, a wide range of athletes, anything from middle school kids to professionals, um, and then to just regular general population on an everyday basis. Yeah. Um, so I've, I've been there for a little while. And then also working as a movement therapist, I own a clinic that's actually based in Woburn, right at my post condition called Movement is Medicine. And I have a number of therapists there. And we work with a kind of a wide range of clientele as well, dealing with chronic movement and stiffness and discomfort issues, helping them kind of regain movement quality and, and get back to doing what they love. And then um, in that process, also starting up the certified functional strength coach education and, and putting together a sort of model that we could really be proud of as fitness professionals that really demanded practical mastery. And that's, that's kind of me in a, a nutshell right there. <laughs> was the, was the goal always to, um, because obviously, you know, following the concept out there and um, you do quite a lot of uh, seminars and that sort of stuff was the plan always to lead um, into sort of teaching, if you like, and, and doing seminars and speaking, or was it something that you sort of fell into? I definitely didn't start that way. I mean, I thought when I when I started at Mike Bulls that you know I, I'd just be coaching high school kids for the rest of my life, right. and I was perfectly fine with that. And um, it's really funny. Uh, I was talking about this to a group of college graduates last week about really understanding your why. Um, if you're familiar with the Simon Sinek book, start with why and the golden yeah, circle. Right and, and I remember Brendan and I reading that very early and I, we watched the Ted talk. I remember cause that was a really big Ted talk. And, and we said, you know, let's figure out what our why is. So we sat down and we wrote it. And that was like when, you know, we were working in MBSC, we weren't really making much money. We were just out of college. We were, you know, we were shutting down the heat apartment so, you know, we could save money type of broke. <laughs> um, and I remember us saying our why was, you know, we wanted to spread the positive benefits of movement and good coaching as far as we possibly can. Yeah. Or you read that book and he talks about your why. He talks about how if you're true to your why, your, your what and your how might change, right? Yeah. And that might evolve. And then also your income will evolve. And income isn't a why, it's a result. Yeah. I remember, you know, thinking like, all right, my why, like right now my what and my how is just coaching high school kids or just coaching middle school kids. And then it might evolve over time. It started to evolve into a coaching professional or collegiate athlete, it evolved more personal training. Then it evolved into therapy, and then it evolved into education ultimately, and I'm kind of doing all those things now. But the why hasn't changed, right? So it's really funny because um, I think that that's 
people in our industry to remember yeah. that uh, if you're really true to what you want to do, there's going to be way more possibilities, uh, you know, down the road if you stick to why you're really there in the first place, you know? Yeah, I think um, one of the, uh, the gym that I, I work at, uh, one of the first books um, when I, um, so two years ago, I got made head coach of the um, gym that gym that I work out. And uh, one of the first books that the owner gave me was Start With Why. Um, and then, yeah, when you read it, you actually realize, ah, yeah, so you can, you know, like exactly how you say, you can evolve and, um, but that why has to stay, has to stay pretty constant. Okay. Um, so obviously, um, mentioned there coaching and physical therapy, um, quite a lot of uh, strings to your bow, if you like. Um, one of the things that I find uh, quite interesting, and you, you put out not so long ago, um, is that you've mentioned that sometimes warm ups can be a little bit boring, but that uh, you can add in movements that add in a little bit of um, variability. Why do you think it's important to add? Um, that movement variability into into warm ups at the start of the workout. Yeah, really. I think I think the warm up is the most underrated thing in the workout, right? We always got this thing we got to do before we do the stuff we want to do, right? It's it's like the dressing on the side, and in in reality, I think we need to manage it as we can because we only have so much time to exercise with most clients. And um, you know, one reason you have to vary this because you know if you're training people day in and day out for years, they're just going to get bored. Yeah. Right. And most people, the reason they quit an exercise program is because they're bored. Uh, they want to be entertained. So you have to trend towards, you know, what I call entertainment um, and, and, and keep the client happy. But yeah. in doing that, you can also give they need along with what they want. Yeah. And I, I, I always think that, you know, a lot of things that people see online and on social media for fitness is like this crazy stuff, you know, people doing like, you know, hands and push-ups on a BOSU ball or doing this crazy like workout that like some gymnast is doing and all these the regular people who don't have the qualities to do that I want to do that right yeah. and I would never you know give people huge variable movements or like really um, outside the box dynamics load but I think the warm-up can sometimes be a good time to introduce things that are a little bit outside of their normal space right um, so for instance, when I'm using things like ladder drills, using multi-directional, multi-planar movements, skipping forward, skipping backwards, shuffling, crawling, rolling, tumbling, um, different things that are a little bit outside of the safe space for gen pop clients live in every day, right? Everyone's yeah. kind of in like this sagile world where they, they get up, they sit down, they go to work. It's lots of times when they lift weights, they never leave that sagile plane either. Yeah. Um, and you know, maybe that's a safe space for most people to lift weight. And, and I would agree that, you know, I think most of the stuff in the weight room should probably be pretty boring for the average person. Mm. Um, you know, push, pull, legs, core, because it takes a lot to get mastery for most people. But when it comes to the dynamic movements in the warm up, I think it's a good time to start to introduce variable patterns. Um, one to keep them entertained, but two to develop the neurological, um, uh, uh, of training like I think that you know if we don't move and try variable movements our brain slows down as we get older we know that so we mm -hmm. want to introduce cross body patterns things where they have to coordinate the right or left and then also as people get older the number one risk for death kind of like once you get into your 60s is accident. so you know thinking about like okay can I get grandma to do a back pedal and a karaoke and a shuffle and a one two stick on a ladder one it's going to challenge her mentally two it's going to challenge her proprioception and her balance and it's probably going to get her heart rate up. It's probably going to get her ready to train. So um, I think a warm-up is a really good time to do those things. I mean, it only takes five, 10 minutes to kind of in incorporate that and get the job done. But I think over time, when you see functionality and activities of daily living and just um, general cognition as people get older, um, it's a really valuable tool yeah. to develop those things. Yeah, absolutely. I, it's quite, I'm quite glad that you mentioned about um, as people get as people get older because, you know, there's no reason why they can't do um, a little bit of power work, a little bit of change, change direction because, as you say, you know, in day-to-day -day life, they, they need to do that. Um, what, I, what I do find interesting is that, um, and this has come up with the, uh, with the small group training that um, I, we do at the, the gym that I work at, sometimes we'll come in, we'll do this, we'll do the, or we did do the same, same warm-up and when you think about it, they go to their job, you know, Monday to Friday, do the same thing. They want to, they, they come to the gym because they want to, they want to come, they want to train and it's an hour where they can, you know, enjoy themselves really. Um, 
But, you know, if they're coming in, it's the same thing over and over again. The sort of that, um, the effort and the commitment they'll put into training, they might not, they might not do there. So adding in different movement patterns um, can, definitely, can definitely help with that. Do you think, um, or do you use, uh, so uh, practicing different patterns, do you vary that from workout to workout, depending on what they're doing, or uh, will you go through a series of movements um, for so long and then change it after a couple of weeks? Yeah, I like to see them start to master things. Um, and then once they do that, that's when I, I change the script, right? And I hate that. Um, <laughs> but... Yeah, I like to see, you know, they get the basics down. Then I'll start to, you know, and it doesn't take much to kind of change things. Like, I mean, for instance, like you could do a lunge, you know, really like with when it comes to load, tempo, direction. So I think it really takes you as a trainer just digging in your toolbox and realizing how creative you actually can get with something that's a pretty basic movement, right? Yeah. Um, and continuing to challenge them. And for clients, might just be like, oh, you're – going from a goblet load to a sandbag load. But for them, it's a whole new exercise, right? Yeah. And that, that stimulates them just be So, you know, I always, you don't necessarily get hurt doing a goblet squat. You get hurt like helping your friend move a couch or a TV um, yeah. just because the load's in a different place. So I always think about like the warm up is a good time to pattern things that are a little bit lighter, threatening, but put the load in a different position. Yeah. Um, and, and for that, it can be a game changer for somebody even just that little adjustment. Yeah. How do you find balancing? Because sometimes um, adding in these different movements and um, doing that sort of stuff, bordering between making sure that it still stays as a warm up, but it doesn't go straight into an actual an actual workout. Because sometimes people will come in, it's like, right, uh, we're going to go through these movement patterns, and then we're going to go into go into your main workouts, and obviously balancing between. Yep, yeah, we want to. Um, uh, fire their nervous system, but we also want them to do the main, um, like you mentioned before, the main strength workout that they're doing. How do you balance making sure that there isn't a big crossover there? Yeah, I think you just want to make sure that you're staying on like the lighter end of the spectrum. Yeah. Right? And just keep the load lighter. And you should probably always, in most workouts, st start from going, you know, static to dynamic, loaded, uh, unloaded to loaded, you know, slow to fast, all these types of things, and making sure that, that we're checking those boxes first. And it, obviously, more advanced trainees, you can start to push yourself along that spectrum more, whereas with beginners, it's going to be a real basic uh, menu until they start to earn their way outside of that, you know. Yeah, and when we talk about the um, the basic movements there, the um, all the foundational movements that you would do like squat, hinge, lunge, all those sort of movements. Yep, I'll even break it down for you. Like I'll just tell you kind of what I do with somebody today. Like I had a group of adults this morning, yeah, and we kind of went through their basic mobility stuff. They all have their own kind of mobility routine that they got to work on. Then we got up and we grabbed a sandbag today, um, as opposed to you know doing body weight or doing like a moving. Uh, pattern circuit and we did hip hinge we did squat we did lateral squat we did split squat um, and we did a get up with it on the shoulder just to the hip bridge and they did like five reps of everything and it was really light for everyone in that group this might have been like a not even a 20 pound sandbag um, maybe like a 15 pound sandbag and for them that got them through all their basic patterns for about five reps so we just kind of checked in with the major you know Hey, I can still do this get up. I can still do this push up. I can still do this lunge, whatever it might be. And then we did some dynamic ladder stuff after that and through some med balls, right? So for them, it's called what I call pattern practice. And I remember Dan John saying, like, if you think something's important, you should probably just do it every day, right? Mm -hmm. Even if the intensity's not high, it's just to make sure that they don't forget how to do it. Because in reality, I see these people two or three days a week there's a pretty slim chance they're doing any of this stuff when they're not with me. Right. Yeah. So like, I'm thinking like, okay, I got 60 minutes. I'm going to give you everything I think is important. Just maybe in smaller intensity each day, but it adds up to, to good movement quality. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a, a great point. I think when people come in um, and you know, you, you take them through an assessment, which uh, will be a, a couple more questions that I'll, I'll ask you about in a, in a minute. But when people come in, they think that they've got um, good movement and they do, all, they do all these things all the time. But actually, realistically, they don't. Mobility is one of those things that, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's really easy to lose, but sometimes really hard to, to get back. And um, yeah, all those, all those foundational movements, if you like, that you should be doing day to day. I think sometimes actually people forget, for example, um, any type of suit, like 
people are pretty uh, pretty good at doing a doing a squat. But as soon as you make them do a lunge or anything like that, then all of a sudden everything just goes out of the just goes out of the out of the window sometimes, um, which is you know one of the basic movement exactly. patterns that you're exactly. able to do. Um, just on that note, when um, in terms of when clients come in and they they have an assessment and uh, for example they might uh, they might have struggled doing a squat or they're going to struggle doing a hip hinge, which I found quite quite a lot of people struggle with. How do you incorporate uh, specific movements in there to, to help with that? Um, or do you uh, maybe use more specific exercises compared to the, uh, the other movements that you might be doing? Yeah, so say, I mean, if they struggle with any movement that's foundational, like you said, a hinge, right? Um, you got to figure out why. So, I mean, is it a movement uh, like motor control issue or is it a true mobility issue? So you got to tease those things out. So most people, if I really see them, if I can't cue them out of them, like give you, them your three hard and fast cues and try to clean something up and, and it's not changing, you got to sit down and take a step back and say, okay, let me do a kind of a keen movement assessment on why they can't hinge or why they can't squat. So I'll give you an example. Literally last night, our lifter come and he's been powerlifting on his own, came to me and was telling me how he had hip discomfort and I said well let me just see it. right and he gave me his squat that he had been moving from a low bar to a high bar position both of them were were just poor squatting position like he he broke way forward and that's why he's getting hip, hip pinching right and so what I did is I laid him down on his back I did this, his ankles his hips his thoracic spine um, and shoulders and and clearly he had the adequate joint mobility in his hips. Now it wasn't ideal. There were some things we could work on, but he could get a, a parallel squat position with a semi vertical torso in an unloaded position. So for me, like the use the tenants of the things in SFMA, right? Like yeah. loaded, unloaded, active and passive. And I was able to figure out and we worked on some motor control drills to help him squat, you know, te reteaching hip flexion, working from the ground up, uh, kind of with, with a four by four matrix, um, and then and working in an unload squat position where he would have to, you know, fight to kind of keep his torso vertical. And over time now, we'll get, we'll get him back to, to squatting, right? So, and, and I really think most, uh, most strength coaches could be very movement, um, movement coaches if they take the time to kind of go through a model like that, like something laid out by SFMA where you, you have a real systemic way of looking at, uh, at movement quality. Yeah, I find that quite interesting because uh, from the assessments that we'll do at the at the gym that I work at, um, I think sometimes uh, exactly as you say, looking at people's movement rather than um, going down sort of the um, it's. I think it still is rehab, but you can still make them do movements to help them get better rather than you know doing loads of stretching and going down the route of foam rolling. I think that has a part to play, but ultimately. To get people, if, if their end goal is to is to get is to get stronger, they still need to move better. So they still need to do those movements. I think. I mean, um, what do you think? Do you think sometimes people are too quick to be like, okay, well, let's stay away from this altogether, and and we'll focus on something else? Yeah, usually I think it, we're too quick to just be like roll and stretch it. Now, say that that isn't a valuable intervention in in many respects, and I think just on the day to day, most people can benefit from doing that, even if they aren't trying to fix a problem. However, um, I do think too often we scare people away from doing things. Mm -hmm. Um, almost all the time exercise is going to be part of a solution, whether someone's in pain or not. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, because there's too many benefits to exercise that can aid healing and can, and can aid in uh, fixing motor control and issues like that. Yeah. Um, I always tell people, I want you to do as much as you possibly can that's shy of putting yourself in the pain. And mm -hmm. we're going to do a really good job of evaluating how you feel at that intervention. Like, for instance, I shot that guy an email that I saw last night today and said, hey, how do you feel today? Did, did your hip hurt after? Um, did it feel better? Did it feel different? Right? You have to take the time to, to look at it because sometimes I think it's easy for people to say, okay, I'm just going to stop. And very rarely is full, complete rest or avoidance going to be the, the right answer. Um, it's about just kind of intelligent. Um, intelligent practice as opposed to complete abstinence from and uh, I think the more as more therapists can start to think like coaches and the more coaches can start to be a little bit more intelligent in how they prescribe things then you're going to see people training 
uh, a lot more and getting back to normal activity is a lot quicker, you know? Yeah, I think, I think that's a great point. The, the physio that, um, that works at or rents the room uh, in, the, in the gym that I'm at, um, uh, she has a big, because she trains in the gym herself, um, she's very much, uh, what can they do? rather than what can't they do. So we'll do all the assessments and right, this is um, this is where I, I think this client's at. Um, this is the program I've got in mind to, to, to put them through. Um, then I'll speak to the physio if they've had any injuries or had any pain. Um, and then they're, they're gonna have a greater knowledge than potentially the assessment assessments that I'll do. But okay, maybe stay away from this, but work on these movements, maybe in the warm up. Um, but in terms of the actual uh, the strength program and what they can do in their workouts, this is what this is what they can focus on. Um, I think sometimes people are, or some coaches are too quick to, if people can't do a movement or struggle with a movement, to call it uh, a dysfunction. I don't think that's really the. Uh, I don't think that's really the the case. Would Would you agree? Yeah, I would one hundred percent agree. Yeah. Um, and then that's the, the therapist you described that, that's in your clinic. That's the type of person you want who kind of sees, you always want to see the, um, because the client is almost always seeing it half empty. Um, you know, they're always kind of seeing as like this injury or this problem, this dysfunction. They probably had another therapist or another, um, practitioner of some sort, tell them what was wrong with them for a really long. So really we should look at it as our job is to show, tell them everything they're doing right. Um, so that provides them the positive feedback and the motivation and the encouragement to, to, to practice towards getting better, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the one, uh, one question that, um, uh, obviously I sent you before we, before we set up the, uh, before we set up the podcast, uh, and you mentioned at the start sort of, you know, especially with people, uh, you know, as people get older, they still need to develop a little bit, uh, a little bit of power. Um, but one thing that, um, what I find quite interesting is that uh, one of the coaches uh, I work with, Matt Cook, um, at, at, the, at the gym, um, he runs our uh, sort of athletic um, program. And one topic that we quite like talking about is the Olympic lifts for, uh, for power, power development. And uh, in some areas, some people will say, right, the Olympic, you want to get uh, more explosive? Just do the, just do the Olympic lifts. Whereas um, as more variations are coming out um, and it's not a case that you can always or have to just use the Olympic lifts for explosiveness. Um, what are your thoughts on the Olympic lifts for developing explosive power? Yeah, I mean, I always liken exercises as tools, you know, like I, the table saw is a great tool, but you, you need other things to build the house. You can get a lot of work done with the table saw. Right. Uh, but, but if you want me to, uh, hang a picture with it, it's probably going to get messy. Right. You know, so you, you have to have a big toolbox as a coach. And I think it's a dangerous thing when we marry ourselves to certain next, we all have personal biases, like no matter how hard you try, because like some people really like Olympic lifting personally, or they're really good at it, or they have had success with it in the past. And, and I think it's a really good tool for the right athlete at the right time in the, in the right program. Right. So, um, it's something we do. We do, um, hang cleans, hang power cleans with all of our, um, like high school and middle school kids. We start to teach them the basics, um, and teach them how to develop power. And then more importantly, how to pulse and catch as well. Cause I think that's also a really underrated, uh, valuable piece of the Olympic list. Yeah. Uh, then also there's, a large population of our athletes and adults when none of our adults actually really Olympic lift um, because then you start to see the seesaw going the other way when it comes to weighing out risk and reward. And then there's, there's a certain population of athletes. Some of the older athletes that we have um, who might've been training with us for a long time, you know, if they have, you know, injuries, especially some of our hockey guys with their wrists, not really a great option for them. Um, maybe some with history of back pain might not be a great option for them. Um, and then there's certain patterns we want to try to develop power in that might be better suited with, you know, an explosive step up or a trap bar jump or, you know, just loaded sprinting works to maybe position those Olympic lifts out at certain times. So, I mean, obviously it's a really good tool, um, but I think marrying exercises one way or the other always tends to be problematic because then you're trying to build your whole house with uh, it sucks. Yeah. Um, I'm not, so obviously explaining that 
Um, you mentioned the the variety of uh, clients and athletes that you would that you would work with work with um, for obviously developing power. Is there a case where, for example, if you're working with um, athletes or college athletes that are playing whatever sport it may be, um, obviously when they're playing their sport, they're already showing um, explosive power because they're already showing their, their sport. Um, depending on, because the, the foundation of everything is strength, would there be a case where you just get people going through um, just building up that base of strength and letting them focus on their, their power, if you like, when they're actually playing their sport? And if they're, uh, for the general population, would it be a, a long time before you actually start throwing power exercises in there? Or would you uh, put a small dosage of power training into their workouts? If that makes yeah. sense. <laughs> no, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Um, no matter the population, we're almost always training these qualities concurrently, right? Um, strength is obviously, if we're thinking about it in terms of a pyramid, the base of the pyramid. Um, and we're going to build all these other qualities on top, whether that be power or endurance um, or sports specific skills. And strength is uh, going to help it, uh, assist that. I remember Brett Jones saying, you know, you know, strength is the glass, absolute strength is the glass, and all those other qualities are going to be um, bigger the the bigger the glass, you know, the more of those things we can do. Right. And so, I mean, we're always chasing that and, and ultimately, you know, like a lactic power, like, like true power, um, is the show in most sports, right? That's what you want when in team sports, um, in uh, power focused sports, like being able to be fast and powerful and explosive yeah. is really, you know, what sets people apart. That's what makes who he is. So that's what makes, you know, an Olympic sprinter, who he or she is. And that is really um, what, what we're always chasing. So I think we're always going to keep a piece of power development and strength development in every program. Now, depending on where we might be in a training program, we might start to focus more on max strength things. There'll still be a power thread in there. Then maybe towards the end of the training program, we start to focus on contrast or power stuff you know, paired with our strength stuff. So there's a little bit more power and a little bit more sprint development. So it's always in there. And then with our adults as well, like we're always doing power. It just might be relative to what power means to them. So, you know, for a 70 year old, you know, man or woman may be doing power skipping and doing ladder drills and doing a shuttle jump and draws power. Um, Whereas, you know, with my, you know, college hockey guys, they're doing bounds and, sprints and throws and Olympic lifts. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's all going to be in the program. Just the recipe gets mixed up based on, on who's. Yeah. I think when you, when you mentioned in there about working with, working with athletes, um, again, with, uh, with Matt, who, who I work with, um, it's mainly, we were chatting what makes more of a difference in, uh, in a, in a team, in a team sport. Um, you know, if you're just strong enough to badge someone out of the way, for example, you know, I play rugby, are you going to make more of a difference trying to, you know, run through somebody? Or if you've got that, um, that power to change, change direction and run around somebody and, and you know, you know make, make a break, that's what changes games when, when you watch it, as opposed to someone just trying to get into, a, get into a, an arm wrestle. And um, yeah, why I, I, I like the content that you put, put out there is because, uh, for the general population, power is relative to, to what they want it to be. They don't have to be, like you mentioned at the start, um, the start of this conversation about uh, if someone's got uh, back pain, you're not going to really make them do a, do a clean or, or anything like that. Um, what have you found to be uh, your best alternatives for, um, for developing explosive power? Do you have a, a progression or a template to use? Or is it, or do you change it depending on the athletes or general population that you work with? Yeah, so if I'm not doing hand cleans with like the majority, like we're doing that with the majority of our athletes. Um, yeah. But if I'm not kettlebell swing in loaded jumping variations, probably two for most of the athletes. Um, loading jump variations is something we've been really interested in the last year. Um, finding like what the correct load is for them relative to their unloaded um, vertical jump and having them do repeat jumps that way, whether they're holding an unloaded trap bar or a lightly loaded trap bar. Um, that's been a really valuable tool along with uh, a kettlebell swing is a easy one to plug in. Uh, most people with a low risk, high reward uh, kind of turnout, you know? Yeah. 
Yeah, I think um, I'm quite glad you mentioned about kettlebells, actually, because obviously I've seen you put quite a few uh, kettlebell complexes um, out there. Um, and I'll hold my hand up. I'm not the, not the biggest fan of kettlebells using them myself. However, um, the, the, more, um, the more I've learned as a, as a coach as well, working with um, uh, general population uh, and, the, and the powerlifting side of things, um, you still need that element of power, power development. And when people come in and say, oh, I've seen people do this, I want to be able to, to do that. Um, using kettlebells as an easy alternative for um, for power development is a really good is a really good alternative. Um, how do you sort of um, what other exercises do you use with the kettlebells? How far can you go with the kettlebells, and what's the crossover compared to using the barbells? Mm -hmm. um, so with clients, um, I mean the kettlebell. I mainly like the, the one-on-one for everyone is teaching deadlift, teaching swing, teaching goblet squat, teaching double belt, front squat, things of that nature. Um, and then depending on how far they want to go down that road from a skill development standpoint, you know, we can keep going. Um, and they're obviously going to be limited by whatever their mobility constraints are. Now, I really like you know, developing the basic skills, teaching them to kettlebell clean because that gives them the ability to go from, you know, a swing position to a rack position, which gives them the option to squat or press or lunge or carry. Um, and then from there, if, if the shoulder mobility is there, starting to teach things like snatches, right? Because then they can get to an overhead position and, and it allows them to get into a get up position and things like that. So, um, you know, having those basic skills once someone can develop those, I think mainly we're thinking general population clients more than an athletic population. Yeah. It gives them the ability to, to put together a workout, uh, importantly on their own. Um, and what I like about that is I, I always think about trying to create as much autonomy for people. And I think a good tool for that because with the purchase of, you know, a couple kettlebells at home, someone can begin taking care of themselves. Um, and I think in an ideal world, we all become unemployed um, and people can start to take care of themselves. Now that's probably a pipe dream, but I think if you start to teach some skills to people where they can, they can kind of do swings and squats and get ups and, and things like that at home, then we're going to be in a really, really good place. So a really good tool for that. And, and I think they're a great way um, for people to get strength. That's a little bit uh, less demanding on the joints. Kettlebells seem to be a little bit more joint friendly just because of the positioning. Um, and they're a little bit more self-limiting because like when you have a front rack, there's a huge core demand um, and things of that nature. So for Gen Pop, I think it's a, it's a good option to, yeah. to provide alternative uh, loading strategies. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, going back to the, uh, to the conversation we had at the start of, pod, start of the podcast about um, actually uh, movement quality and training those patterns. Um, I know myself from competing in powerlifting. Um, I know that leading up to a competition, my shoulder mobility gets worse and worse for the amount of times that I'm, that I'm benching. Um, and using the barbells, you are locked in it, locked, locked in that position. Um, I'll, like when you mentioned about the powerlifter that you worked with yesterday, um, I'll squat low bar and because it's a little bit down on my back. Again, a little bit of disruption on the um, on my shoulders. But um, using the kettlebells is, you know, is a is a is a good alternative. And when you're chatting there about uh, uh, teaching people so they can go away and you know do the exercises whilst whilst they're away. A lot of my clients will sometimes be traveling with work and it's like, right, if there's a gym out there that's got some kettlebells or some dumbbells, I like to think that I've, I've coached them and taught them enough so that, you know, they can go off and do, do, exercise, do exercises properly. I think, you know, on a little bit of a tangent about coaching is, is making sure that the, the clients learn something and, you know, know what they, know what they, can, they can do rather than um, being really dependent on their coach of, they have to be there all the time to do um, to do exercises. Um, the the other thought on developing explosive power uh, explosive power um, a little bit different to the Olympic lifts, um, but jumps and that sort of stuff, which you mentioned with mentioned with at the start. Um, how do you go about uh, incorporating them? And it's not always about like you'll see some people jumping crazy crazy high on boxes when they don't they don't really need to be. Uh, what are your thoughts on that and how do you use, how do you use them? Um, so one thing pretty much everybody goes through 
at MBSC is our general plyometric progression. And, and plyometric might be a misnomer because in our progression model, we probably don't really get to a true plyometric in the sense of the word to like the third or fourth phase. Um, and that's okay because I think what we need to prioritize with most people is landing skills uh, because, you know, if you're going to get up there, you, you're going to have to land at some point. And if you don't have the landing skills, you'll probably be in trouble. So um, we will work on teaching proper landing position in a, a standard jump in a hop. So one leg to the same leg and a bound. So one leg to the other leg and then hopping multi-directional. So sideways, both directions and forwards, right? So we want to make sure that we develop those skills um, with everybody, whether it's gen pop um, or an isolation. Now, how far we go down that road of progressing that might uh, be limited with a general population client. Um, but with an athletic client, we might progress much more aggressively, right? Um, so we're, we're always doing that kind of in what we call like our power circuit prior to hitting weight room um, over the course of the week. So we might, you know, do jumping on day one, hopping on day, hitting on day three, and then medial lateral hopping on day four, something like that, and, and sparse those out across the program. And then kind of work towards static landing positions towards more dynamic, continuous, true plyometrics as the phases go by. Um, so we're always, and then as you mentioned how we use jumping as an alternative within the program in the lift. Uh, um, the way I really like to do loaded jumps, what we do is we'll find the vertical jump um, of our athlete. Like what's their vertical, right? Um, and let's just say this athlete had a 30 inch vertical jump, right? Um, and we'll use a, a just jump mat for ease of measuring, right? If you're familiar with the just jump mat, they just step on and, and true to the name, they just, they just jump, right? Yeah. And, and what we'll do is have them jump and we'll get that measure and then to use a weight that is roughly around 70% of their unloaded vertical, right? Um, so if this athlete had a 30 inch, I would say they'd probably be around 21, 22 inches. Uh, we weight that allows them to jump 21 to 22 inches, right? And a lot of the classic literature, they'd say like, oh, you want to use, you know, 50% of body weight or of their back squat and when you look at that those numbers are really kind of ridiculous um because it, it really the the load on the, that they're jumping with shouldn't translate to their body weight or their squat numbers because that doesn't necessarily translate to their explosiveness right i've seen some really small people who aren't that explosive i've seen some big people that are and i've seen vice versa um so you got to really base it off of their jump percentage and that's going to bring everybody's numbers way way down as far as load goes um, is that the jumps still look good? They still look athletic, and we're seeing improvements in vertical jump that are that are fairly significant. Um, so, so that's really if, if someone isn't going to be Olympic lifting, maybe they're not kettlebell swinging or something like that. Um, some of our athletes, that's kind of how we'll go about determining how to load jumping in the program. Yeah, I think sometimes when it comes to it comes to power, people think that um, obviously. It, it's got to be a, it's got to be a fast movement. Um, I think sometimes people are too quick to say, "Yeah, let's just load it up and um, and, and let's see how, how heavy we go." But um, or like a box jump, trying to get as trying to get as high as they can, which isn't the, which isn't the point um, the, the point of it. Um, obviously, mentioned there about uh, working with the, the athletes that you work with, and um, the more that. Uh, the more athletes that come into the come into the gym, and the more um, general population that are potentially leading towards or getting a little bit better um, with their with their running. Uh, one thing that I find quite interesting is that people uh, who are running, um, once you start speaking to strength training about them, uh, I don't need to do um, strength training. Uh, I do I do lots of I do lots of running. I don't need I don't need to train legs because I've already I've already run. Um, why is it that strength training is actually so important uh, when it comes to running? Um, and, and when you have people that, that are adverse to it, um, I try to open their eyes to the research that shows them, you know, pretty starkly otherwise, right, that, that it's a valuable tool. And, and what I try to explain to them is that, you know, simply strength, is, uh, strength training will give them a bigger buffer zone for injury. Um, and allow I'll tolerate the stress of running 
Um, it allows them to be more economical in their running. There's plenty of research to show how strength training, plyometric training improves running economy. So they actually use less oxygen to do the same task and they tend to do it faster. Um, and it makes they're going to be able to use more elasticity and to be able to deal with the stress. So they don't break down over time. You know, most of the time the athletes will deal with overuse injuries. Um, so putting, uh, both good for bone tendon and, and, and muscle, um, over time is going to make them more, uh, more able to deal with that accumulating stress as the training program goes on and better able to control joint positions. If we're coaching these guys as well, if we teach them to create a good foot position, we teach them how to get into a hip the right way. If we teach them to create a good torso and pelvic and rib position, then all the way to them running better. Typically the fear that most of these athletes have is, Oh, I'm going to get too big. Right. Um, and, and that's usually the most unfounded fear that there is, especially in runners is I, you, I couldn't pack enough weight on these people if I could. And, and in reality, I work with a lot of uh, competitive endurance athletes and, and I typically see them twice a week and they have a whole bunch of other training to do. Yeah. Um, like if you're seeing a triathlete, they might have two, one or two other programs in the day. So it's not like they're on some bodybuilding program where, they're going to wake up one day and look like Ronnie Coleman. Um, <laughs> I, I just want, I just want them to, to maintain the muscle mass that they have because the, you know, lose the bottom of the bottle every single day with the training that they're doing, because it's really hard for them to get enough calories in and they're continually putting calories out. Um, so we're trying to help them build a, 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 a physique that will last in, in, and be tolerant of the stress they continually put upon it. Um, and, and I was assured them like, trust me, you're not going to wake up one day and, and, and have giant arms and shoulders. I, I, I sure, assure you I'm not that good at, <laughs> at what I'm doing, make you more tolerant to the stress. So these programs are very basic typically, um, but that's really all they need. And, and it's just real, uh, a big focus, basic mastery, um, and, and making sure they feel good too, you know, that, that, that it fits into the, the big picture of, of their entire training program. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, what when people come in and they they mention that they're running to get um, better at running, best at better times. Yes, they need to um, they need to go out and run. You know, that's their training. It's like a rugby player training for rugby. You need a ball in his hand um, and uh, doing the, the the skills that is needed needed for rugby. The things that happen in the gym are only going to benefit. Um, uh, what you know what happens on the field or, or what happen what happens on the what happens on the track um in terms of uh the obviously mentioning there about uh, actually mastering um the movement patterns and it's quite a, quite a basic program how would uh how would you go about setting up um a strength training program for a runner uh, how many days would it be what 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 would it look like uh, in for a general uh, general program I mean, generally, I've seen them around two, two times a week, but it might vary depending on where they are in their season. You know, maybe we scale it back. Maybe we do more sessions, but shorter sessions. Um, really kind of depends on our overall schedule. But I would say generally we're seeing them twice a week. And, and I'm, I'm really looking at, you know, one, like, like think about the buckets that are really low um, with endurance athletes, especially when you're dealing with athletes on extreme sides of the spectrum, either one way or the other. I always think about the idea of being a bucket filler, like what buckets are empty, right? I'm really not addressing any endurance work with them. I'm just, just making sure I, I coordinate with whatever they're already doing uh, with their running coach, their swimming coach, their, their cyclist coach, whatever it might be. Um, I'm working on a lot of stability and landing work and progressing towards, you know, the plyometric work that we talked about, teaching them how to get off the ground quick and then be able to stabilize at the end. Yeah. Um, and then from a strength standpoint, um, I mean, every week they're going to squat every week. They're going to split squat every week. They're going to deadlift every week. They're going to single leg deadlift. They're going to single leg squat, single leg variations. Um, they tend to really struggle, um, in, in really being able to get into a hip and, and, and maintain a good femur position while they run. And, and that tends to be a big problem and getting them to sometimes take those running shoes off so they can feel the ground and reestablish a they do a standing row or when they do a split squat or something like that. So really the basic fundamentals, they're going to push pull um, and do core and ab, and ab work pretty much every day. Um, they'll basic anti-extension work, anti-rotation work, um, and, and just maintain that because in, in reality, lots of times their running is going to start to take them in the other direction. 
kind of uh, making sure that we maintain these qualities. And a lot of times when the volume's real high, you know, we have to continue to pursue strength. It's just like in season training yeah. with, you know, a team, a team sport. Um, the buckets can indeed. So we got to make sure every time we have an opportunity, we, we pour all these qualities right back in there, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, with the, when you mentioned in there and going back to what we were talking about, uh, talking about before, uh, at, the, at the start about the, about the movements, um, and you mentioned there that you're going to, um, make sure that they can do landings and, uh, sing, single leg work. Um, how much in, because every time that, uh, a runner that will come in, uh, they'll always mention that they've got some sort of knee pain or hip pain or anything like that. How important is making sure that they, um, yes, they might be going out and, and running for X amount of distance, whatever their program is, um, but making sure that they've got ankle stiffness, that you know, um, they're running a little bit more efficiently so the knees aren't caving in. Um, that is an element of uh, not necessarily the... Um, the squatting and the strength training side of things, but you know, going full circle, if you like, back to the start of that movement and um, master, mastery, um, if you like, uh, how important is that, and how long would you spend on that, and how would you work work on that? Yeah, and I mean, I think it goes all the way back to them doing mobility work every time they come in because um, you start to see that stuff disappear maybe quicker than anything because um, you know, again, they. They, as much as you tell them they to stretch, a lot of these, you know, do the old quick pre-run, you know, pull on the ankle a couple of times and then go start running. So we probably sometimes have to prioritize the mobility segment just to make sure the, the right. And then continue to stress that. So, I mean, I'll start from the joints and then zoom out, right? Make sure the ankle moves, make sure the knee moves, make sure the hip moves, make sure the T-spine moves, make sure the lumbar spine moves, make sure shoulders move all the way up. Then we'll start to zoom out and do those patterns right so like we talked about earlier kind of going through pattern practice okay make sure you can do that then start to once we've zoomed out to full body movements then we start the the contraction spec you know dynamic power work into true strength work right so it's always we're, we're shifting our focus throughout the whole workout and i always say like there's no part that you know is less important it's it it's a uh it, it, we have to continually uh, put it all together. I know Mike always has said, you know, it's a recipe, not a menu. You don't get to pick what you want or what you like. Uh, you got to put everything in there. And depending on the athlete, those pieces might shift a tiny bit, but it's the same, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think um, what, why I mentioned about that, you know, and, and, and finishing off um, speaking about runners is that um, it, all, it all, you know, link, links together. Um, there has been an influx of, uh, of clients who have, who have been doing running that, um, you know, exactly like you said, showing them the research of the benefit of, of strength training. And it comes down to, you know, whether you're a runner or an athlete or anything like we started, started speaking about um, at the beginning, making sure that they can actually um, move. Um, and, you know, uh, the, the explosive and the, the explosive power side of things is relative depending on, um, on who the client, who the, who the athlete is. Um, so quite a lot of topics um, covered there, but uh, that's why I wanted to have you as a guest to chat about those, chat about those topics. Um, from everything that we have spoken about, what would be your uh, take-home points or words of wisdom for everyone listening? Um, I think the, the biggest words of wisdom I could give is it's the best program is, you know, one times 365, right? You want to make sure you're doing something all the time. Um, I think in a world where we're always thinking about faster, stronger, thinking about um, consistency is probably not the sexiest thing in the world, right? Um, and that just doesn't matter if it's an athlete or matters or if it's an adult uh, in the long haul you know, it's a whoever gets the most quality work over, you know, if you're thinking about your life over 90 years, or you're thinking about, you know, an athlete over their career, that's, that's going to be better off. And in my time now, I've been at MBSC, and I can tell you the athletes who have had the longest, healthiest careers, maybe they're not all all-stars, right? I think we all rise to the level of our natural ability and our hard work. But um, I think that, you know, the ones who enjoyed the most success over the long haul are ones who were the ones who consistently worked. Um, and the same can be said for the adults that I've worked with. I can think of some people I've worked with now for the entire time I've been there and some people who are, you know, into their later years of life and they're the ones who just kept showing up. Yeah. Um, and and I, they weren't always all-star efforts, but they were efforts, right? And so I think to continue to preach that for ourselves, for clients, because 
continually being taught, you know, you know, they can do it in a shorter, harder and faster when they should be thinking about how do I want to feel 20 years from now? And, and that's really the most important thing. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a, a really good take on message consistency. I'll speak to, um, you know, when we have, when we have the assessments or their, uh, their, their monthly check-in, uh, consistency beats, beats everything. Um, and when some people say, you know, from the, uh, from the general population side of things, oh, well, um, this guy added X amount onto his deadlift or they lost X amount of fat or did this or did that. Um, but sometimes it's just one fluke result. You know, if you're just that 1% better every day, keep turning up, keep, you know, it's, I, I'll always say about quality workouts rather than just, you know, running yourself into the ground, trying to do, trying to do as much as you can. Uh, and when you mentioned there about athletes, you know, I, I follow sport myself and, um, there's there's some superstars that you actually look at their stats and the games that they've played. Yes, they get all the rave reviews because they might do something awesome in a game, but out of a, I don't know, um, uh, for example, the, the Premiership Rugby season, 22 games, um, they might only have played five. Whereas, you know, the people that are they're staying at the top of the game and playing all the time, um, you know, it's that consistent that they're, that they're all, all the time. Um, so, yeah, great point to uh, finish on. I uh, hope everyone enjoyed listening to that as, uh, as much as I did. Um, for everyone listening who uh, might want to see the content that you put out from uh, Movement as uh, Medicine and uh, from the work that you're doing at uh, Mike Boyle Strength and Conditioning, where can people find you and the, and the content that you put out there? Yeah, so the best place is really um, one of our Instagram pages. So at Movement as Medicine on Instagram, pretty much putting out stuff multiple times per week there, kind of like our running blog. Um, and a lot of that just kind of ends up at our website that's at move, that's uh, movementismedicine.com too. And then um, for a certified functional strength coach, we'll put all of our events on our website, uh, certified FSC, and it's the same on Instagram, certified FSC. So if you're looking uh, for content online, I'd go on there. And if you're looking for courses as well, uh, we'll pretty much put everything through those two outlets. Awesome. Um, thanks a lot for taking the time to, to chat with me. Um, you know, from the from the work that um, you do and the work that you do at um, uh, Mike Boyle's place as well, um, it's helped me a lot as a coach, and um, it's helped me uh, provide a lot more um, uh, value to the to the uh, athletes and clients that, that I I work with. Um, so thanks again for taking the time to chat with me. Thanks again to everyone listening, and I will see you all next week. Thank you.